it is a real great pleasure to have Dr. Menegas to be here. It's, he overcame tremendous, tremendous traffic impediences. So eventually, you can be able to go It's really glad to have you here. Okay. Uh, he has a very interesting career. Processes at the molecular level and try to understand the, the physics behind them. 
And something important is that we're not only wanting to observe, but we also want to interact, right? So, and I'll, I'll explain in a little bit how we're going to uh, do that. So the technique that I'll be telling you uh, about today mostly is molecular dynamic simulations. And the basic idea here is that we can use accurate physics-based models, which can be based on, on quantum mechanics or classical uh, potentials. And we can explore both dynamic processes as well as ensemble properties. And so this is something which is very powerful um, in, in, in that sense. And also, uh, recently, is something that we have been able to use high-performance computing to look at very complex systems, which uh, makes this technique uh, very nice to, to study uh, some of these uh, biological problems. Now, probably many of you are familiar with this. I just want to make sure for, for people who are not uh, so the basic idea in this uh, molecular dynamic simulation, so for example, let me imagine you have a water molecule here and we have a classical uh, type interaction. So this uh, oxygen can be connected to a hydrogen atom through, let's say, a spring, which we can describe with a simple harmonic potential. We can also have things like a, a bond bending, uh, which can be described by uh, something that, that's a harmonic potential on, on the bond. Uh, as well as having, for example, partial charges, which can be used with a simple uh, electrostatic uh, potential, and so on. And so we can build a, a model of different models of different complexity depending on what we're uh, interested in. And then the idea that, if, given these uh, potentials, we can do we can integrate <coughs> using equations of motion, so F equals m a, and then we can propagate the motion of these molecules over time. Uh, given an, an initial configuration. <clears throat> okay, so today I'll be telling you about two sort of different uh, projects. This is a, uh, this first project that I'll be telling you about is on the rational engineering of an enzyme that is used uh, for cancer treatment. Now, Sandia has typically never really done uh, cancer. That's just something that has not been part of the mission. But a few years ago, there was a higher manager at Sandia who became uh, diagnosed with cancer and was treated at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, which is one of the top leading cancer centers in the world. And after this experience, he realized that there was a lot of technical expertise at Sandia that could be used to uh, help in some of these problems. And so he brought uh, different groups from there at, at Sandia. Now, this is how this project started. <coughs> and this particular enzyme that I'll be telling you about is creatine is used for treatment of acute lymphoblastic, lymphoblastic leukemia, which is a cancer that affects mostly children. So what's uh, the idea here? So typically, when we talk about cancer treatment, we talk about poisoning the cancer cells. Asparaginase works differently in that it tries to starve the cancer cells instead of uh, poisoning them. <coughs> and this is something that has been used for over 40 years for this particular uh, cancer treatment. So here I have a very complex model of a cell. Uh, so Typically, a cell needs amino acids to build um, other uh, proteins. So asparagine is one of those building blocks for protein synthesis. A, a regular cell can get asparagine from multiple sources. One of them can be the bloodstream, so it can get this complex from the blood, but it can also synthesize it from a related uh, amino acid called glutamine using this particular enzyme asparagine synthetase. In the case of uh, these leukemia cells, there's not enough of this enzyme around for this pathway to work, so it really relies on whatever is available in the bloodstream in order to, to, uh, to do any proton synthesis. So the idea is that if we use this uh, asparaginase enzyme, this asparaginase enzyme destroys asparagine and converts it into aspartate, and by doing so in the bloodstream, it removes this source of asparagine for the uh, ALL cell, which effectively starves it. For a regular cell, it's fine because you can still synthesize it from this other uh, molecule. So sort of uh, the, the, the chemistry of this, you have this amino acid asparagine, and here's the chemical structure. And what this enzyme is doing is taking this NH2 here, and it's uh, exchanging it for an oxygen. So you take the water molecule, and the enzyme catalyzes this exchange, and you end up with a product, uh, a uh, byproduct of ammonia and a proton. <coughs> So, now the, the reason why we're interested in this is because the treatment is not perfect, right? So we, we want to be able to improve it. And so even though this has been used for over 40 years for cancer treatment, there are a couple of problems. The first problem is that it has a low catalytic rate, meaning that it's not very good at doing this, this reaction, which 
uh, effectively means that you have to have high doses in order for it to be effective, which causes uh, toxic side effects. The second problem is that the, the enzyme can actually catalyze many different substrates, not just uh, asparagine. So here's a related amino acid, the glutamine, which has an additional carbon. This part of the molecule, uh, those two parts of the molecules are the same, but it has an additional carbon, and it can catalyze this, this secondary, uh, what's called secondary glutaminase activity. And this has also been linked um, to toxic side effects. <clears throat> so then we have two goals for optimization. One is to try to uh, improve the, the catalytic rate, right? So make it more effective uh, at, at, at catalyzing this, this reaction so that we can use lower doses as well as tune the substrate specificity so that we can get rid of this side reaction that we, that we don't want. So how are we going to uh, go about doing that? So we, before I joined this particular project, our, our colleagues at the uh, University of Maryland have started doing some modeling using a molecular dynamic simulation. Here's a cartoon representation of the enzyme. The enzyme is made of a uh, homo tetramer, so four identical uh, protein subunits. And the active side of the enzyme is here at the interface between two of those subunits. And here's sort of a zoomed in um, picture. So here's our substrate here, and these are amino acids of the protein which participate in the reaction. So one of the questions is, okay, this enzyme catalyzes two different substrates, right? Can we learn something about how the enzyme interacts with these two different substrates to understand is the regions of the enzyme that we can tweak so that one substrate fits better in the active side compared to the other. So we do these molecular dynamic simulations and we, we look at the subjects here, the asparagine substrate, this is the one that we want to maintain the activity, and here's the other substrate, glutamine, which is the one that we want to get rid of. And if we look at the contact interactions between all the amino acids of the enzyme near the active site, we find a particular amino acid, this glutamine 59 in the, in the enzyme, that contacts a fair amount of the time with this amino acid glutamine, with the one that we don't want, but it doesn't contact asparagine, which is the one that we want to keep. So our colleagues at the, at the MD Anderson Cancer Center, they did this mutagenesis study where they took this particular amino acid and they, they changed it, they tweaked it with, diff, 20 di with 19 different options here, and they found one option where they mutated this amino acid for a hydrophobic amino acid, and they were able to maintain the activity that we want, the asparaginase activity, while completely eliminating the glutaminase activity. Just by tweaking this one amino acid, we were able to make the fit of this substrate in the active site in such a way that is not conducive for catalysis. And, and this really shows sort of the, the, the power of using the, the simulations to guide um, uh, the experiments. Now, in, in terms of trying to go to our, our second goal, which is to improve the catalytic rate of the enzyme, and we want to make this enzyme more effective, we need to understand the complete reaction mechanism. Now, in terms of how the whole reaction takes place, we have, uh, this is sort of an schematic representation, and you know, don't worry too much about the details for those of you who are not uh, chemistry books, but the, the basic idea is that the enzyme has this nucleophile, uh, this amino acid that acts as a nucleophile, and it attacks this particular carbon here. Now, I want to remind you what we're trying to do here is get rid of this NH2 and exchange it with an oxygen. So the enzyme does the nucleophilic attack, that's done by either one of these two amino acids, and this is known from other experimental data. And something magical happens, and then ammonia becomes cleaved, so this part gets cleaved off the substrate, and then you have this enzyme uh, covalently bound to the substrate, then you have a second nucleophilic attack by water, which then releases the final product. So we want to study this, this complete reaction. Now it gets fairly complicated, so I'm going to focus for, uh, for the rest of this part of the talk and just this first um, um, component of the reaction, this first nucleophilic attack, and the way that, uh, so, so okay, this is shown uh, schematically here. So we have our substrate here, we have, this is one, of, this is the nucleophile of the enzyme, and we, what we want to do is look at the reaction when we take this oxygen and we drive it into this carbon here. So we want to look at that particular chemical reaction. 
So in order to look at this, we have to uh, go into the, the quantum mechanical level so that we can look at bond breaking and, and, and bond formation. So for this, we use uh, an initial uh, molecular dynamic simulation. So what we can do here is that we can use uh, techniques such as density functional theory to, um, to solve Schrodinger's equation and use this uh, quantum potential to, so instead of propagating the dynamics of the system using a classical potential, we use uh, the, the, the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian to, uh, to uh, uh, drive the movement of the atoms. And so what I'm going to show you here is, so this is a, now, one, one of the, so we, we, we gain a lot from this approach in the sense that we can look at a chemical reaction, but this is also very expensive. So instead of being able to now simulating an entire uh, protein, we now have to simulate just a couple hundred atoms. So what we do is we take the active side of the enzyme, which is about uh, 240 atoms or so, and then we have our substrate. So here I'm only showing you a part of this, of this uh, whole uh, QM subsystem. So here's our substrate, here. here's the enzyme, and what we want to do is take this oxygen here, and we're going to bring it into bonding distance of this carbon and see what happens. <coughs> now, uh, there's a proton here that is connected, that is uh, bonded to this oxygen, and I want you to pay attention to what happens to uh, that proton. I'm going to show you a quick movie here. So here we have, we're running this ab initio and this simulation, and we bring these two atoms into bonding distance, and what you see here is that this proton, as soon as these two are within bonding distance, this proton jumps onto this oxygen of the substrate. <coughs> And this is very interesting because it, it means that the, the substrate is actually participating in the reaction. It's actually activating this oxygen uh, in, in order to do this, uh, this uh, catalysis. So this is sort of, uh, schematically, this is showing what, what uh, this uh, uh, amnesia simulation is telling us, is that as this oxygen attacks this carbon, this guy takes this proton from, uh, uh, from the enzyme. Now this is very interesting because it explains a particular requirement of the enzyme. So when we look at the, all the possible substrates that the enzyme can catalyze, there's always a need to have a carboxyl group within two to three carbons of this uh, amide group, which is the one where we're trying to catalyze the removal of this NH2. So if you have that in close proximity, the enzyme can catalyze it. But if you have this carboxyl group too far from here, then it doesn't work anymore. So this particular function of, of the substrate explains that uh, selectivity of the, of the enzyme. <coughs> now in terms of, um, so we have this, this intermediate now where the enzyme is covalently bound to the substrate. And what we see is, so, so now you have an oxygen which has an unpaired, so it has some unpaired electrons here and is negatively charged. And it's stabilized by some hydrogen bonding donors here. And this is, if you pick up a biochemistry book, this is sort of uh, shown as this called the oxyanion hole. Um, but one of the problems that we see is that if we use the same ab initio and simulations to look at the stability of this particular complex, it's very unstable. So if we, if, if we uh, let go of the system, you know, so we, have, we bring them into bonding contact, but then if we just allow the system to propagate over time, it falls apart very quickly. So in less than 0.025 to five picoseconds, it falls apart to what you started with before you brought these atoms together, and the, this proton jumps back to where it came from in, in the, from, the, from the enzyme. Now the energy difference between these two states is roughly 28 kcals per mole, which it's, it's, it's a bit high, but it's something that, that we can live with. Now it turns out that we can actually stabilize this particular reaction by pre-protonating this oxygen, and then, so we're basically splitting up this, this part of the reaction into two steps that are now lower in energy. So I told you that before, the, the energy difference between these equivalent states was somewhere around 28 kcals per mole. We can break it into one step that is 11 and another one that is 16. So it's roughly the same energy, but now you've broken it up into two steps of lower, of lower energy. Plus, you get a big, of the benefit that this is more stable to continue on for the remainder of, of the reaction. Something else that is, that is interesting from, from this particular uh, uh, simulation is that when you have 
this, this azo enzyme intermediate, right? So when you have the substrate covalently bound to the enzyme, the hydrogen bonding becomes different. So you, so it, it, it originally you have this sort of two to one hydrogen bonding, but then when you when you have this coordinated, it prefers to have this sort of paired hydrogen bonding. And you know this is something that it may be subtle, but it turns out that we see this in experiments. So uh, experimentalists are able to look at the crystal structure of this enzyme with the substrate as well as the, this particular mutant that gets stuck in the middle of the reaction. So here it ends, so the, the reaction is not able to continue, it gets stuck in the middle of the reaction. This is the, the crystal structure that is obtained experimentally, and this is what we see from our QM calculations. And when you superimpose them, you see that they're very similar. They're not quite chemically equivalent, so they don't match perfectly. But the, the, the bottom line is that even though we cannot see the protons in the crystal structure, it is very likely that there is a proton here. And the reason why this is interesting is because um, biologically, you wouldn't expect to have a proton there at the pH, at the regular pH levels where this enzyme functions. So there's something particular about the environment, the electrostatic environment of the enzyme that promotes this and helps uh, the reaction. Interestingly, we also see this in other crystal structures. So we, using the, uh, the classical MD simulations, we can try all different coordination states, so we can add protons at different positions. And the one that fits the best with what we see experimentally is when you have this proton on the alpha carboxyl, which again is very unusual uh, given the, the, uh, the biological pH at which uh, this is done. So I, I want to sort of wrap, uh, wrap this up and continue on to, to, to a different topic. So let me just summarize what we've been able to do with the, with the molecular dynamic simulation. So using the, this empty guided um, uh, models, we are able to eliminate this secondary glutaminase activity of the enzyme. We are also able to show that uh, the substrate plays an active role in the reaction, which explains a lot of the selectivity of, of the enzyme. And it's also supported by experimental uh, crystal structures. Now the remaining steps of the of the reaction still need to be mapped, and that's something that I'm working on using hybrid QM uh, molecular mechanics methods. Um, and so that's something that, that we're working on right now. And then something else that we're, we're trying to look at is that they, they are homologs of this enzyme from other bugs. So there are some of these uh, this bugs uh, from Erwinia Karatabora, Erwinia uh, chrysanthemi, which have very similar structures. So if you compare their crystal structures, they're very, very similar, yet some of them can be up to a thousand times faster in catalysis. And we have you know, just very slight differences in their, in their structure. And so this is something where we, we recently put in an NIH proposal to try to uh, figure out what we can learn from, this, from these bugs to optimize the, uh, the, the catalytic uh, activity of the enzyme. Any questions on that before I move on to? OK. All right. So. I know this was a little bit heavy on the chemistry, so I'm going to switch now on something that is a lot uh, more uh, physical based. So this is, a, this is a project that I worked while I was a postdoc at the Technical University of Catalonia in Barcelona, Spain, and it's related to this biological process called mechanical uh, signal transduction, and it's this idea of how um, biological systems can sense mechanical stimuli and convert that mechanical stimuli into chemical signals. And so I'll be telling you about this particular channel in uh, bacteria, which uh, acts as, a, as an emergency release valve, and using this, this hybrid um, MD simulation, some continuum analysis, we're able to figure out sort of a molecular mechanism for how this can work. Okay, so mechanization plays a very many important physiological roles. Uh, it, so as I said, you know, the conversion of uh, external mechanical stimuli into chemical signals. So think about, for example, a blood vessel, right? So if you have a, a change in pressure in that vessel, that needs to be uh, communicated to the heart so that the heart uh, rate uh, is adjusted, right? So there needs to be a feedback control between those things. So this is very important in classical pressure control. 
Also, for example, in osmotic regulation, right? So if a cell becomes swelled due to whatever uh, reason, it needs to be able to regulate that. And things, uh, you know, as basic as sensing touch, healing pain, uh, mechanical stimuli, it plays a very important role. And recently, also, people have uh, understood that sensing changing in cell volume and shape is very important for uh, development. Now, the, the basic idea here is that so our, our cells have these biological membranes which are made of uh, lipid bilayer, right? And so you have these uh, amphipathic lipids, so these are hydrophobic here and hydrophilic here, and there's water over here and water over there. And you have these channels, and many of these channels, they conduct um, particular ions, and by doing so, they can relate signals, right? So for example, some of these ion, some of these ion channels can conduct potassium, and by doing so, they can activate other molecules uh, and, and relay a signal. And the way that, the, that this mechanotransduction can take place is through this force from lipid principle, where the idea is that if you stretch the membrane due to whatever external mechanical stimuli, you can open these channels, and then by doing so, you can uh, relay uh, an electrochemical signal. So I'm going to tell you about uh, this particular mechanosensitive channel from bacteria, which actually in bacteria it serves as an emergency release valve. So bacteria don't get to choose where they land. They often land in hyposmotic solutions, right? So solutions where the concentration of the outside is much lower. And very quickly, this bacteria will begin swelling to the point where if that pressure is not released, they will explode. <coughs> So the bacteria have these uh, mechanosensitive channels, which are really emergency release valves that when the internal pressure gets to a point, they open up and release uh, and water as well as other, as other solids. And you can do these nifty experiments where you can uh, remove these uh, uh, channels from bacteria and you can watch them rise as the pressure becomes uh, so high inside. And one of the questions is, in, in terms of the actual molecular basis, how is this external uh, stimuli this tension or pressure actually activate uh, these channels. So one of the nice reasons why this particular channel is, is uh, a nice model system, at least from a physical perspective, is that there's really no biochemical regulation here. So this is really uh, a mechanical valve in, you know, at the molecular level. And uh, the channel is made of five identical subunits. This is shown here in blue. And this is sort of the side view and then uh, top view. And this is kind of a cartoon representation of what that looks like. <clears throat> now, in order to be able to, to understand, sort of try to couple what's happening at the molecular level with this larger scale uh, mechanical stimuli, I, I worked for, for a couple of years, something that I have continued to work with uh, uh, our colleagues there in Spain, is this idea of obtaining continuum stress fields from uh, particle-based systems. <coughs> and uh, I, I worked uh, for, for a number of years of developing uh, some code that is available at this website if anybody is interested. So we have uh, implemented this uh, in, in a couple of different codes. So the, the basic idea here is that you have a kinetic term. So this is the, the kinetic portion of the stress. So we're trying to calculate something that is, the, is a stress field, a three-dimensional stress field. So you have a kinetic term, and this is sort of like a kinetic pressure, right? So imagine a balloon filled with gas. The pressure inside that gas would come from this. So this is a, like an ideal gas uh, contribution. And then you also have a potential term, which comes from the different interparticle interactions, right? So these particles are interacting with each other, they accept forces on each other, and you can obtain a stress from that component. Now, let me give you an idea of what I'm actually, what this stress looks like. So, for example, here's a, a graphing sheet. So, we simulate a, a large graphing sheet and we introduce a stone whale's defect here in the middle. And then we calculate the stress, and this is what the, the, the natural component, so the, the, yeah, the, um, the diagonal component of the stress looks like in, in terms of a, of a surface tension. So, with this, with this, we can actually see very nicely, you know, from a mechanical perspective, what's happening near the defect without knowing much about uh, the particular interactions uh, in this area. And so we can expand this into our, our membrane protein system, 
And so in here we can actually calculate a 3D stress field. So here's our protein system, which is composed of about uh, 150,000 atoms or so. So here in the translucent I'm showing this is water. So there's water on top and bottom. Here's our membrane, a liquid bilayer, and then our channel is in blue in there. So we can calculate this 3D stress field. Now, it, it looks kind of interesting, but it's not very helpful as it is because there's too much information. So we can do a, a neat trick from continuum mechanics, and that is to uh, visualize the traction. <clears throat> so if you take your stress and you take the product with a normal vector, so we take a surface, in this case we take the surface of our protein, and we calculate the traction on the surface of that protein. So basically we have this force per unit area acting over the entire surface, calculated from all the interparticle interactions in our simulation. And so we divide that into two components, a normal component, so basically what's acting perpendicular to the surface, as well as a tangential component which is acting on the surface of, of, of the protein. And so in here, blue means arrows pointing into the surface, and red means arrows pointing out. And then on the tangential side, we just have the arrows. And I'm sorry if, it, if it's hard to tell from the back, but so you can see all the arrows pointing different directions. Now the real question is what's happening when we apply a mechanical loading, right? We want to understand how the mechanical transduction takes place in this in this system. So what we do is we take our we take our, our, our membrane system and we stretch the membrane and then we look again at the stress in our system. And so we now have the, the, the traction, the normal component of the traction here under this mechanical loading and what you can see here is that there are regions of very highly localized stress, right? So if you look back here, you had some a couple of these red spots here, but now these are, have become much bigger. <clears throat> and what this means is that there's, there's some areas which are more prominent for the stress to be distributed when you apply this mechanical loading. Now interestingly too, when you uh, look at the tangential component, there's also a big difference in this uh, tangential component acting sort of upward towards the middle of our, of our protein here. And so, so this is sort of shown schematically here. So our lipids are being pulled outwardly by, by this mechanical loading, which is applying some forces here. But it's also thinning the membrane. And by thinning the membrane, it's applying sort of uh, forces that are pushing down towards the, to the bilayer midplane in both uh, directions. Now the question is, so now that we know sort of the regions of the protein where we have these high localized forces, what's happening in the chemistry in, this, in these regions? So we can do different kinds of analysis. So our protein is surrounded by lipids, and we can look at the interaction between the proteins and the lipids on the two different sides of the channel. So there are lipids here, there are lipids here. And if you look at the hydrogen bonding patterns between what's happening at the top versus happening at the bottom, there are a lot more hydrogen bondings on this side of the channel than there are on the top, and actually twice as many. And when we look more closely, it turns out that there are a bunch of positively charged amino acids here, which are interacting with uh, electronegative oxygens on the lipids, uh, on the lipid molecules. So for those of you who are not familiar with the, with the lipid chemistry, so this is sort of the head group of, of the lipid. It has a lot of oxygens, which very nicely hydrogen bond to these positively charged amino acids which are on this side of, of the protein. And interestingly, most of this, of this channel, of these uh, lipids, are interacting with four of these uh, particular amino acids. Something else that is, that is interesting from, from the simulation that we can see here is that actually the protein has some hydrophobic cavities where the lipid tails, so that the tails have these two hydrophobic lipids, they can fit in very nicely in these hydrophobic cavities. And this is interesting because if you look at the crystal structure obtained experimentally, these cavities are not apparent. But when you actually do the simulation, you can see this very nicely. And experimentally, we have a very nice agreement from this, where we can see that the cytoplasmic side, which is this side of the channel, has a higher affinity of lipids versus the periplasmic side, this uh, side over here. And this is because we have these uh, hydrophobic cavities on this side of the channel. Now, if you look sort of uh, at the motif of what's, what's happening here, it's something that is relatively straightforward. You have this part of the protein which has this positively charged amino acids. They interact with the negatively charged uh, 
portions of the lipid head group, which you have a nice electrostatic interaction, and then you also have this sort of confinement of the lipid tails due to these hydrophobic cavities. And this is very interesting because this region of the protein is very highly conserved. And usually in biology, when you have something that is very highly conserved, it's because it's very important and structurally it, it, it means something that you cannot easily tweak without destroying a particular function. So something that we can do from the, from the simulations is that we can actually estimate the energetics of this interaction. So we can use a simple Arrhenius Bell model here. So if you look at our protein, membrane protein system from the top, here's a little membrane patch. Here is our protein. And we have the lipids that are attached to the protein. And we can just apply pulling forces and yank these lipids out of the protein. And by looking at the, at the unbound lipid fractions over time, we can do this, this simple analysis, obtain these this different parameters of the Arrhenius Bell model, and estimate that it's somewhere around 10 to 13 kTs per lipid are, is, is, the, is the energetics of this uh, association. Which is, which is very interesting because it's relatively large. If you think about that, you have about two of these lipids per monomer of the enzyme of the channel, and we have five monomers, right? So we have 10 of these lipids which are tightly associated uh, to the channel, which are uh, uh, fairly high. So, as I said before, we want to be able to interact with these systems. So what I'm showing you here, so here's our channel sort of looked at it from the top. And one of the questions is, if this interaction is so strong, can we actually actuate the channel? Can we gate it? Can we open it by pulling on these lipid handles? Right? So what I'm showing you here is the lipids that are tightly associated with the channel. The rest of the membrane is there. I'm just not showing it to you. And what, we're, what I'm going to show you is that we're going to apply radio pulling forces onto these lipids and see if we can actually activate the, the channel. And so the pore of the channel here starts very small, and as we apply pulling forces on here, we can actually open up the channel by applying this, this pulling forces here. And I just want to uh, point out that the lipids can come away from the channel. They don't, so we, we're not imposing any kind of interaction here. This is just the regular electrostatic interaction that, this, that the lipids and the protein have, but it's so strong that we can actually actuate it by pulling on this. And this is sort of showing it from the side. So if we were to take like a slice of the channel, you can see the pore here opening as we pull on these lipids outwardly. And this is something uh, very interesting because experimentally, it has been predicted that in order for the channel to open, you have, so here's our sort of our, a cartoon representation of, of one, one of the monomers. You have this part of the protein where which is where we see this strong lipid association. And then you have this part of this transmembrane helix, which is at a certain angle. And in order for the channel to open, you have to have some tilting. So the idea is that this part of the protein can serve as a sliding anchor in that as you apply tension, it can slide sideways and help tilt this transmembrane helix in order to, to open the channel sort of like the iris of a, of a camera. And that's what I'm, I'm showing here. So if we, if we draw this particular subunit as, as this helices, you can see that as we apply pulling forces on the lipids, we see an increase of the tilt of these different subunits as, as the channel gates, um, sort of confirming this, this experimental prediction. Furthermore, if we look at so one of the nice things about this setup is that we can apply pulling forces on these channels in very different directions, right? So if we look at it from the top, we're just applying radial forces pulling outwards. But if you look at it from the side, we can apply forces along different directions. So we can have uh, not just purely lateral components, as well as purely vertical components or somewhere in between. And if you look at the space, sort of the space space here of these different pulling forces, only certain, only certain uh, uh, directions of pulling can actually actuate the channel. So there's some intrinsic physics in, in, in the structure of the channel that determines what pulling forces can actually actuate it. So if you 
just pull outwards, it doesn't open the channel, which is a bit counterintuitive thinking that as we pull on the membrane, we're just pulling laterally, right? So you would think that if you just pull laterally, you would open the channel, but it doesn't. You really need to have something that has both a vertical as well as a lateral component of the force in this pulling in order to activate the channel. And similarly, if you just pull vertically, it, doesn't, it will deform the channel, but it will not open it. And if you pull too strongly, you can actually rip apart the subunits of the channel. So the interaction between the lipids and the protein is so strong that you can actually uh, make it unwind. Here, that's what you see here is that the channel is actually ripping apart. Okay, so to sort of summarize this, so using this, this combination of the, of the molecular dynamic simulations with this continuum analysis, we're able to really sort of get to the bottom of a, a force transduction mechanism at the molecular level, right? So connecting this mechanical loading with how the channel can open and gate with uh, these uh, this localized forces on the surface of the channel. And the, the main thing is having these this electrostatic contributions here, which can then couple the, the mechanical loading of the membrane that is going sideways to pulling these this lipids outwardly really that way. But at the same time, when we, thin the mem when we pull on the membrane and we stretch it, the membrane becomes thinner. And so it's not just being pulled out that way, but that hydrophobic mismatch of thinning the membrane is also including now a vertical component of the force, and so we have both forces lateral as well as vertical in how this channel uh, uh, may be open. And this is something which uh, in, in recent years has become really important, that understanding these lipid protein interactions is really a key for how these molecules uh, are gaining. Now I just sort of want to emphasize in sort of the, uh, the importance of, of this and how there's really a lot of questions in terms of how these these uh, channels may work and how what they're doing. So I want to give you an example of this PSO one channel. About six years ago, people didn't really know what these channels were doing or why we needed them. And today we know that if we don't have these particular channels, for example, in mice, as soon as the heart starts beating in the embryos, they uh, cannot develop a cardiovascular system because this cells, the epithelial cells cannot sense the pressure from, from the beating heart. And so this is something which you know, it really goes to uh, show how much we don't know about this, 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 in this particular interaction. And we, we really know very little in terms of structural information. We have about 26 structures of this particular type of channels out of this over 100,000 in the protein data bank that are labeled as mechanosensitive uh, proteins and they really correspond to about seven different channels. So we, we know very little, but there is a lot that we can learn from, from the structures. And something which uh, becomes very interesting, at least at the level of uh, eukaryotic and mammalian channels, is that many uh, mammalian channels that are mechanosensitive sensitive are also ion selective. And this is very interesting because when you look at ion selectivity in these channels, the way that these channels, uh, for example, this is a potassium channel, the way that these channels select for potassium is by creating a coordination structure that mimics the, uh, or resembles the energetics of how the ion is solvated in solution. And that, that solvation, energetics, and coordination structure changes for every particular ion, and that's how some of these channels are able to um, select for, for example, potassium with uh, ratios of 100 to 1, while still being able to transport 10 to the 6 ions per second. So you have very fast transport with high selectivity, but you need to have a very specific structure, right? And so the question is, how can we couple this mechanical activation, which is in, in a way is kind of sloppy, right? You have this large scale mechanical stimulus with this uh, you know, highly structured motifs for, for ion selectivity. Okay, so sort of to summarize, um, both, both 
part of the talk. So I showed you, uh, hopefully I showed you that the molecular simulations can provide a, a really powerful way to understand um, and, and observe and interact with the biomolecules to explore structure and function and that there is a very nice connection with experimental results so we can make a, uh, we can really connect the two things together not only to, to uh, make predictions that can be experimentally tested as well as provide molecular level understanding of, of known experimental behavior and, and even discover hidden features of, of structural data that couldn't see or, or were it apparent just from looking at, at, at those. And of course we can use this multi-scale approach where we can look at things at different levels depending on what kind of knowledge we're after. So we can go from things at the level of quantum mechanics or atomistic or even with this continuum analysis to understand things in a little bit broader perspective. And uh, you know, these methods are very highly interdisciplinary. What I, I show you a lot of applications towards these biological systems. I hope that uh, you can see that there's many other applications to things in material science and, and other areas of soft condensed matter physics, even though I may not have touched on, on that much. So I want to acknowledge um, the people that helped me with this work. So my mentor at Sandia, Susan Remy, um, the people that I worked with at the, uh, the Technical University of Catalonia, Marín Marroyo, and a physics student, Alejandro Torres, that we worked uh, closely on this uh, continuum analysis work. Um, our experimental colleagues at the MD Anderson Cancer Center and uh, uh, experimental slash modeling colleagues as well at the University of Maryland and funding from and uh, computing time from uh, different sources. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to. Right. Yeah. One one of the issues. So so this. 
this this curve transfer here. Um, one of the issues is that when you when you change the pH, there's a lot of there's a lot of groups around the active site that can change perturbation state, and so so this is difficult to look at um, experimentally. Um, what, what, what can actually happen because there's so many other factors that can change when you when you alter the, uh, the pH. Something that, that um, we have considered is to maybe look at um, if, if you can somehow label different parts of, of the enzyme with something that you keep track of whether the proton is going there, then you know that, that could help uh, that. But right now it's, it's difficult to tell um, I mean, it's difficult to test this in a more direct uh, experimental way. Mm -hmm. And my second question is, so it seems like you show 20 kcal per mole of energy yes. difference, mm -hmm. and then it's broken down to the 160 kcal mm -hmm. mole. Which step is the rate determining step? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, we're still, so, so for one, that, that energy is probably a little bit on the high, this energy is a little bit on the high side. So one of the issues that we have here is that the, the active side, in order to maintain the structure of the active side, we have to fix some of the atoms, right? Which limits the mobility when you're doing this, uh, this particular reaction. And particularly bringing this oxygen over here, it's a big movement of that, of that residue. So because we have to fix some of those atoms, that really limits the mobility, and so more, more, very likely we're overestimating the energetics of this. So uh, experimentally, they estimate that the, the whole um, energy barrier for the reaction is somewhere around 20 kilopounds per mole. So it's, it, it, we're, we're quite a bit over um, what, what you'd expect. But um, so that's why right now, so now we're trying this hybrid QMMM method, where we can include a larger part of the enzyme so that we can have a bigger um, you know, range of mobility of those, of, of those atoms. But most likely, I mean, it's, it's hard to know right now uh, without going through the complete reaction mechanism um, to know which is the rate limiting step. So we don't, we don't quite know what, what that is. And your uh, initial MD was over 200 kilograms per mole. Yeah, for this one, the longest one we did two, two people seconds. And from the reaction barrier, Right, yeah, actually that's a really interesting question. 
question because uh, these channels can also be actuated by addition of conical lipids. So there are lipids which have, uh, for example, just one lipid tail, so have a higher area on the head group than on the rest of like the, the lipid. Lip, uh, like the lysolipids. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that depending on which side of the, of the membrane, if you add them on this side versus if you add them on the other side, it can actuate it on one versus not the other. And it only works, it, it's, it's easy. What do you mean actively one instead of the other? So like, if you add them on one side, it won't do anything to the, to the, to the channel, but if you add it on the other side, it will, act, it will open the channel without applying any tension. Mm -hmm. So there's certainly something about, about the curvature effects that will also be important in this. The thing, so one of the limitations here is that because of the size, uh, it's hard to study uh, geometric, you know, complex geometries in these kinds of systems because of because we have periodic boundary conditions, right? And so, you know, that makes it difficult to study that. But, but certainly, that would be something really interesting to look at is addition of these conical limits and how. Uh, and, and certainly, within the context of this um, uh, this continuum analysis, we could do something like that where we can add these conical lipids on, on different sides of the membrane and then we can redo this kind of analysis and see does it resemble what you see when you have mechanical loading or does it look differently and then what can we learn from that? Yes? Um, in your first project you mentioned that uh, you used a quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, right? Mm -hmm. um, so for the quantum matter physicist in the room, how would you set up such a Hamiltonian? You know, what kind of terms would it have? Ah. <laughs> So okay, so so you know this is this is probably a lot more crude um, in terms of, of you know what uh, you guys uh, typically uh, do here. So the, the basic idea here is that you use the uh, um, so that you use the Bohr-Oppenheimer approximation, right, where you assume that your nuclei are stationary, right. And then um, you're separating your nuclei part of the wave function from the electronic part of the wave function. And then you're just solving for the electronic part of the wave function, um, ignoring the core electrons. So you're really just looking at the valence electrons and solving the, uh, the system for those. Um, so the dynamics comes in here. The dynamics is purely classical. The dynamics is purely classical. So what you say is that you have this electronic Hamiltonian and then you just get forces from that, from that Hamiltonian and then you propagate the dynamics purely classically. So, so there's, no, there's no dynamics here from, from, from one of the effects of the, of the, of the nuclei. Yeah. You looked at uh, the effective forces on channels. Mm -hmm. In the case of nerve impulses, uh, the channels, uh, the conductivity for ions of uh, uh, channels change. Mm -hmm. Are there any, is it known if there are any forces associated with the change uh, in uh, ionic conductivity uh, when a nerve impulse is propagated along the nerve fiber? Yeah, that, that's, that's a good question. And so, for example, if you look at this, um, So the, this picture is from these potassium 2,4 uh, types of channels, which are very interesting because they're polymodal in that they can be activated by many different kinds of, of stimuli. So they can be activated by external mechanical stimuli, but they can actually be activated by temperature, as well as pH, and, and, and other like amphipathic molecules, like these weird shaped lipids. Um, and so, you know, it, from, from your question of, you know, can, can the, the basically the potential difference across the membrane, can it also affect, have a similar effect 
uh, want this? And, and that, I think that's a question that is really interesting that goes back, is there a sort of a common mechanism in how these channels can be modulated in, in terms of, of, of the structure that maybe that the structure of the channel, how it can be modulated to, to change the conductivity and how that structure can be coupled to different stimuli that you know could be more chemical or mechanical um, in that sense, but I think that that's definitely an open question, and certainly, for example, in this uh, KCSA channels, that you know uh, that has been very controversial. Um, for example, in the discussion with Ron McKinnon and so on, people have very different ideas in terms of how potential can uh, uh, gate uh, these different channels by by moving different parts of the protein. But I, I mean, I think it's certainly an open, an open question. I have a question from uh, mechanical uh, channel protein. Mm -hmm. show this uh, uh, Yeah, there it is. It seems to me the lower part is doing nothing. It's the weight. Is it? Which one? Yeah, from the lower part. This one? Yeah. Oh, this part? Yeah. Well, okay, so actually, the, the, so, okay, so there's a, this is interesting because this is kind of like a colander in that, uh, it, so when, when this channel opens, it's because the pressure inside the cell is so big that it can actually, it's at the edge of rupture in the cell, right? And so the pressure inside is so big that it can send very large solutes pushing through here. And so by going from a big channel into five smaller openings, this can limit the size of, of things that can be pushed through the channel. So you don't, so you don't have like a, a larger solute going through here. And this also helps to keep the channel together. So if you were to have this, I can see how it would be a lot easier for you to just like completely rip apart the channel. So in a way, it sort of keeps it together. So it has a limit to how much it can expand. Right? as well as limiting the size. And actually, people have done these really interesting experiments where you can change the length of this little loop here, and you can do these interesting molecular sieve experiments where you can try to push things of different sizes through here, and the size of things that you can push through here is directly dependent to the length of this, of, of that loop. So will that make it kind of much easier to open? I mean, no, I know this seems like a lower body Structure, but right. then you use much less force to open. Is it? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good question. Yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> okay, another question is the volume of membranes. Uh, mm -hmm. You show the membrane after you stretch. You have one is the other, and the other one is become interfigitated. Mm -hmm. Now, if you interfigitated, that's different effect. Well, okay, so it's, it's partially interdigitated. I mean, in order to have thinning of the membrane, in order to have, sorry, in order to have thinning of the membrane, there, there is a little bit of interdigitation, but, but not the same extent as when you have this fully interdigitated phase where you have a full intercalation. Right, right. So there's, there's some, but even in this case, there's a little bit of interdigitation. Uh, it's, it's very small, but there is, there, there is a little. 